Hi everyone, my name's Rebecca, I'm an ichthyologist and I'm also a PhD student specialising in laurel cards and plecos. So today's topic is going to be practically about that. Um, so this video is an introduction to laurel cardo, so these are plecos just to make it easier. And I will do a video maybe, although I've already done one on the topic of the name pleco, because it might not be quite what you think. Lorcardae is a family of fishes within an order known as Solovum. So this is the catfishes. Um, even though they don't look particularly like what you stereotypically would think catfish would look like. They do have many of those anatomical features though that you can see across this, um, across the order. They are generally, well, Lorcardae are freshwater whereas Solophon largely is freshwater, although there are a few marine and brackish, or those that will travel between the two different taxa such as Aridae. So Lorcardae plecos, the defining anatomy is these dermal plates. So catfishes don't actually have scales. They, so, so those that look like what they would be scales, it's actually known as dermal plating. So this is formed of bone or bone-like structure. And this really gives the shape that laurel cards display. It can vary in extent and shape across the taxa. So ancestrous and ketostoma, for example, it might be shorter around the head, so that dermal plating might stop. And it is quite connected to that skeleton. They also have what's known as odontos, and these are external teeth formed of dentine. They are not used for feeding, they're not feeding structures, but they might be used in defence, reproduction, um, a whole variety of different things. Um, they might be located all over the fish, and they are found across many different um, catfish taxa, but they'd be located all over the body largely, and they might be what's known as hypertrophoid, which means sort of larger, um, in certain regions. So in some taxa, the pectoral fins, so those fr first side fins, that could, they can have hypertrophoid odontos, maybe in one sex more than the other, usually males, but I've seen it in females. Also the caudal peduncle, which is sort of the back end before the tail starts, um, that can have it. The t uh, tail fin, which is the caudal fin. And then in some taxa, such as Lassie and Cistrus, I'd say, also Pseudo and Cistrus, um, Oh my, planet, uh, not planet. They blink these. It can be hypertrophoid on the head. There, um, and the other defining feature is these, um, the sort of rasping, sucking disc. Although not all can actually rasp or suck with it in a way, and they're not particularly. They don't feed particularly via sucking anyway they have quite impressive jaws and it is eventually facing jaws so they're feeding below them almost so that's sort of the defining features um in some taxa you see a lot of different unique structures different morphological structures such as incestrous and also that incestrous tenta uh, ten tentacles um they might have um tentacles on the head and these are derived originate from well derived from the sheaths that these odontodes um, develop from um, early on and it's usually partially sexually dimorphic it really depends on the actual species that we're talking about so Laurel Cardae is diverse, there's about 1,030 1, species at the moment. So to put that into scale, uh, there are larger taxa such as uh, larger taxa such as Cyphonidae, which is sort of carps I guess. Um, but with this amount of species there's more than many different mammal groups, so they are extremely diverse. Um, they Lorcardae is divided into several subfamilies and our, there is a bit of a debate it seems about what counts and what doesn't. So the three 
definitely certain ones or the so the three biggest ones anyway are hypostomine that's the largest hypostomine contains hypencystrus barencystrus so a lot of your typical pleco species the larger the rounder canthicus um, and it's sort of evolving into many different sizes shapes it's very difficult to define because it is so large and so diverse the next one is laurel carinate. These are the elongate species. These are like Farlowella, the twig catfishes, um, Stereosomitic these, which is like um, the royal. I'm going to say royal twig, royal, um, royal whiptail, also Pseudohemiodon, and these are the ones that, especially like Pseudohemiodon, they don't really rasp as much. They're sort of sifting through the substrate with that very ornate mouth that's also used for breeding. So not all Laurel Cardae are crevice um, spawners. There are some that breed in different methods. The other large subfamily is Hypopotomine. These are your miniatures, our miniature groups, miniature species. They are largely evolving towards that miniature size. So this is Otocinclus. Um, Hypopotoma, uh, uh, Rhino Autosynclus, I think it is. Um, and they come in they're all different shapes and sizes. Um, there's even um, Astridium, which is evolving to look, or looks a lot more like um, Laurel Carne than it does actually look like um, Hypopotomine. And it's also got a vivid green colour, which is absolutely stunning. Although a lot of this group tend to be a little bit more sensitive, I find, in captivity. So the next groups, anyway. So Rhine Lepine, this contains Rhine Lepi, um, what was it? Rhine Lepis, um, Pseudo Rhine Lepis, and then there's a few that I can spell but I can't uh, pronounce or rem remember how to pronounce the name in a way. Um, but these are very unique. They look, and I think they were included once in Hypersomnia, but they are a lot more basal, so a lot more um, in comparison. The word basal isn't really the most reliable word to use, but they are placed a lot more distantly in the family tree of Laurel Cardae than um, Hypersomnia. So this is, uh, so the pineapple pleco is probably the one you'll see the most. Um, it has a modified swim bladder as far as I know. It's quite unique in its movements, it's quite unique in its behaviour. Um, it's a little bit more active in a way, a little bit more, it will move a lot more than a lot of Laurel Cardae tend to s sort of be very slow unless they really want to do something and they're not quite so active as this sort of subfamily or at least pseudo Rhinephis is. It's very unique looking anyway, it's a very unusual um, subfamily. Then we've also got Delta Urinate. You won't see them often in the trade. I believe that's due to Brazil um, export regulations. And then finally, and finally, this is the most unusual, obscure one, a uh, Lithogen. Genine, which includes like lithogenes, I guess is the best way to say it, or genine. Um, there you won't see in the trade, I've never seen in the trade, and I've never actually seen it preserved either. Um, they're, they're the ones that I think have been debated whether they're actually in Laurel Cardi and actually not. Um, they're just a bit more unusual. So, generally it's not one to concern with. So, well, so the location for Laurel Cardi, they are exclusively originating from South and Central America. They aren't actually, um, they don't originate from elsewhere. There are many taxa that share or have evolved a similar body shape, a similar body plan elsewhere, such as if we look at um, Riveji, we've obviously got Hillstream loaches, so that's Suelia, or Gastromyzon. In Africa, there's other ones, I don't remember the scientific name. Um, um, there, obviously you've got Synodontis in Africa, there's many that do rasp on algae in a very similar mouth shape. Um, also like Chiloglanis. 
So they're all very similar taxes they're found elsewhere, but low car date is exclusive to South America, and I guess the biogeography would be the reason why. They're found in a, a whole variety of different habitats. Generally, from what I've seen, they do like a particular current, and that is reflected more in their morphology, whereas you'll see other taxa maybe in different habitats. Um, they do seem to really like a current, but then compared to many other groups they do come from a wide variety of different habitats they might be a strong current a s some more sluggish one it might be black water it might be white water it can be high temperatures a uh, 30 plus easily or it can be low temperatures about 20 or lower uh, like ketostoma many of them are found at lower temperatures also a few ancestors there's quite a few species found on um sort of hill streams so very high flow, clear water, cool water. So they're not a taxa that is easily sort of defined uh, when it comes to habitat so much. Um, and this does lead into their diets. They feed on a variety of things. The majority, and a lot of people or places will say or disagree with this or sort of, sort of they won't, say the right, I guess not tell the entire truth of it, the majority are algivores or detritivores, algivores feeding larger on algae and I would also include into that um, sort of other periplankton and all fruit. Detritivores feeding larger on detritus which is really difficult to define because there's several different types of detritus in the source and then also what's in detritus because obviously it probably will build up quite a bit of bacteria so that's a really difficult group to define detritivores. Um, you, I would say I kind of split them there's sort of more special detritivores such as Panax, Panaculus which feed on either fungi more and bacteria within the wood or they feed um, in wood and then there's ones which feed more on invertebrates within the wood so whether they're, it's really difficult to define this taxa because a lot of these categories aren't really they weren't made I assume for fishes they're made to describe land animals, sort of tetrapods, where there's, it's, the aquatic world is so different because there's so many different taxa that might act or look similar, such as you've got animals like uh, bryzoa, and then you've got all sorts of different bacteria and stuff that might, you need the similar feeding apparatus, but it's very different from if you were going to be a carnivore. And then you've got like sponges as well. Sponges aren't like what we consider a normal animal. They're one of the more early ones, I guess. Um, and they're impossible to go in captivity anyway. So it's a diverse group and you've really got to look at individual species. And the problem is with this is because it's so diverse is that they've been amalgamated too much by a lot of sources to say that they eat them, they are pretty much the same thing when they're not. And this can lead to massive mistakes, um, short captive lifespans, um, not breeding at all in captivity. There's just so many issues with how they're kept in captivity and a lot of myths involving them. The size of Laura Kai's ranges from, I think it's 1.8 um, centimetres to, let's say, 70 centimetre standard length, so excludes the term. I'm being a bit generous or being a bit strict on the Canthicus size because the Canthicus adenis, it could be well over one metre standard length, including a Canthicus high strix, actually. So, and there's no sort of, the median isn't going to be that 30 centimetres, quite a few, there, there's not actually that many towards that larger size um, particularly and even with common ones, um, plenty are well below 20 centimetres, 15 centimetres, even 10. The only issue, so when you get to the real miniatures like Hyperpotomine, there's a little bit more limited in what you can find available in the um, trade. So the final thing I'm really going to talk about here is the L number and the LDA number system. So these are used or you'll see used 
referring largely to hyposomnia, but most, well, a lot of lower cardiac are put within this system. Um, depends, so some, ta some subfamilies less than others, um, but it does, it is used for a lot of them. And this is a system, both systems were used to designate largely undescribed species or variants of species until they could get a proper description and then they would no longer be used but they're still used um, quite well extremely frequently more than scientific names sometimes therefore sometimes people forget that they've ever been described and the problem is with this system is there is no set uh, diagnosis set key features Whereas a paper, when you write a scientific paper, you have to write a diagnosis and a description, which includes basically all the morphological details of what defines that species. So someone can look back and compare it to another and say, this defines this species, whereas you don't really have that with the L number system. And also it might not be, might not reflect nature at all, even though taxonomy and scientific names have their faults with that. So this system is just extremely popular and it is pseudoscientific, it's not scientific, not many scientists use it. Um, there's more starting to now as I guess the hobby is contributing somewhat more to the science. The other issues of this system, one species can have multiple L numbers. So Barium cistrus at Xanthellus has what's it, four L numbers and one LDA number. It's got L81, L18, L18, L81, L177. These refer to different juvenile colorations, but it doesn't actually reflect what's in nature. There's so many in-betweens and differences and ones that look less like well not like neither of them and then you've got l85 which is actually an adult l18 which i don't entirely understand because uh, they all look the same as adults they all look they all get to the same size they all get to about 30 cent i'm going to say 30 centimeters and be vague at that because there's some really large ones out there their spots go down their markings go down they are not the same fish in the same in most lower cards this happens to anyway where they don't look quite the same as the juveniles or you might have one L number that describes two um, different species so Baronsistus dermatoides and Hemiosistus subiverdis are both under L200 so these are different species they are more or less sister species regardless of the errors in their genus <laughs> And the only real defining feature is one has a membrane between the dorsal and the adipose fin, the other doesn't. So it's not major. Um, the actual height of the dorsal fin I don't think varies and neither does colour or in a reliable fashion. So this system does have errors and it also gets misused. So you might have, for example, L1... L144 used for the common bitternose of the blue eyed variant, but that actually describes a different species imported probably 40 years ago, 30 years ago, that doesn't exist in the trade. It was a one off variant that looks completely different. It died, it doesn't exist. It's a less attractive fish to most people, so I have no idea why people love the name. And then you've got like Acanthicus. Adonis, I think, is is it one 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 five gets used for it, and it's not actually one one five. Um, Paracistus avantiacus is another one. It's got an it keeps getting called an L number that it isn't because that L number actually refers to Pseudoncistus, and I would not get bogged down with L numbers if you they're not that use. Well, they're useful, but don't get bogged down with them because firstly, there's plenty of resources that will help you with them and 
they they're only meant to be temporary anyway and there's only a minor difference which makes one different from the other so I prefer not to use them personally if I can avoid it so it depends whether this species is described then I'll use the described name if it's not I won't I won't list variants either because I don't think it's entirely helpful especially because you're really making it sort of blurred on what defines the species anyway and then so it's just and I don't know I won't I also might not list it if I don't think it's helpful because sometimes SP is more reliable um, so anyway I've done I, I've got several videos on the L number system and I don't think any different to how I did then maybe a little bit more skeptical on it but it does have its uses um, especially for undescribed species just categorizing them so see I for ancestors there's a I can see really limited use just based on the fact it's so diverse and there's so many without any numbers and if you can't give a description it's really difficult to define the difference between the two and it can be misleading you can think you've got one fish and you've actually got another um, and there's so much use in descriptions anyway so anyway thank you for watching and if you like my videos please comment like and subscribe and if you have any videos you'd like me to make just say and thank you for watching